let's all stand and grab our hymns and turn to, uh, well, I, I think this is an old one. I'm sorry. <laughs> we know this hymn. It's in the old hymnal, so we don't have it. But this is Come Unto Me. Let's sing it. Hear the blessed Savior calling me oppressed. Oh, yeah. to show uh, God our thanks and our love for him than to be in the house of God this morning. I ask that our ushers go ahead and come as we prepare for our offertory. Um, we sure do hope that if you're here visiting with us and if you're here as a member that you came to prepare your hearts and your minds to hear the word and through the song and through the message this morning. We're so thankful to have you. And at this time, Brother Justin, would you open something a word of prayer?
There is something about that name. Kings and kingdoms have passed away for thousands of years, but it still stands true today as it was then. So if you didn't know that song, that's what that was. Something about that name. Let's grab our hymns and turn to 786 and let's sing Count Your Blessings. When upon life's pillars you are tempted, sauce. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Burdened with a load of care, does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. Uh, let's turn to him 772 and sing when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Turn to hymn 139. Let's sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou change. Has 
standing as we continue to celebrate the goodness of God. This Sunday we close out our thankful series and we get ready to jump into our essential Christmas playlist beginning next month. But we're not going to go there yet, even though a lot of you have already got all the decor up. We're still thankful for God's goodness. Everybody, had a, I pray, had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Yes, uh, a lot of great food, family, all the things that go with that. Uh, just maybe some Pause moments where you and God did some serious uh, thank yous, and I hope so anyway, and let's just continue, because even though we're post-Thanksgiving, we, uh, we can continue to give God praise. So I want to invite you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, in verses 4 through 9. God's word says, for verily, when we were with you, we told you how that you, would su you should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress 
by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. You may be seated. So this morning, we have talked a lot about things to which we can be thankful for. And I kind of went in a different direction under God's lead because, quite honestly, it's not something I would typically preach in my past on a Sunday morning, but for whatever reason, here we are. But it needs to be said, especially in a time in which we are living, in a day and age in which we are living, I today am thankful for the faithful. Now, what do we mean by the faithful? I think the word somewhat speaks for itself, but just to give you some understanding, not everybody in life is faithful. You may not be, you may, uh, not be faithful at all times in your work, or you may not be faithful to get your homework in all the time. Um, and sadly, in our world today, many people say we are Christian, but we're not always faithful to Christ. And that would be kind of a, a misleading if we do such a thing. I don't know where our world would be. I don't know where our communities would be, and I certainly don't know where our churches would be without the faithful that come and continue to serve in and out no matter what life brings. So I want to look at what this looks like, and this is also an admonition not only to say thank you, Lord, for these that are serving, but I pray by the end of this message, it's, it's a holy nudge, it's a... Um, uh, 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 can we say people's elbow from the pulpit? I mean, whatever you want to call it in the name of Jesus Christ, that we see the urgency to be of all things faithful to God. And if you think this means just being in church, I'm going to tell you from a guy that's been there, done that, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're faithful to God. Going to church is one act of many that shows how much we are serious about the things of God. But are we faithful to the things of God each and every day of our lives? I would want to see us through these people in Thessalonica. What a testimony and example they carried. What a powerful witness they were for us many, many years later, yet still moved to see what they did. Three things I want us to look at. First of all, the faithful endure troubles. The faithful endure. Now note, I didn't use the word experience. I would say every one of us in here know a little bit about experiencing trouble. Trouble could come in the fact that you're trying to get out of here today and in between here and there you get a flat tire. There's some trouble. I mean, you know how much tires cost today and then you might not be able to take care of it yourself. You might not have the means with a, with a spare to, to, to do that immediately and now you're late for whatever you're trying to get to. Troubles. Maybe bigger troubles than, than just a, a tire issue. It may be a conflict going on in your workspace or maybe some circumstances of health or whatever it may be. Every one of us here know what experiencing trouble looks like, but that's not what we're talking about. To be faithful doesn't mean, well, I experience trouble. Well, then everybody's faithful, but that's not the case now, is it? See, to be faithful means you don't just see the wall. You just don't touch the wall. You don't know the wall is in front of you, but you find a way to maneuver the wall so you can keep on keeping on. You can keep on going. Because you're faithful in your walk and no walls may get in your way. Hindrances and obstacles may come. You find a way to navigate in the power of God because you will not let. So the word is not experience, but it is endure. You see it, you work with it, and you keep on keeping on. All believers understand this because we all know. But what difference, uh, what the difference that separates the faithful from others is not just when obstacles, pain, struggles arise, we know that the faithful will not just let that stop them, but the faithful will continue to endure. That's what we see with this group in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, a picture of endurance in spite circumstances. We remember, if you, I'll jog your memory back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all things. So this is consistent with Paul's writing to them in, 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 uh, in this letter as well. But when the, when the Thessalonian follower with this person or group, people group, we see struggle. We see, we see afflicting circumstances. And it's, Paul was so moved by and he was so concerned for them that he said, I'm going to send Timothy. Timothy being one of his young preachers. He says, I want him to go. 
I know you're going through things, and I want him to be able to come alongside you in your moments of weakness, the challenges you're facing. And by the way, can I get an amen or something? That, isn't it good to have good brothers and sisters that will come alongside you when you're struggling? You know what I'm talking about? You're down, you're defeated, you don't feel like you're gonna be able to get up. I mean, you know, I mean, you're trying your best to do your best Rocky Balboa, you know what I mean? You've been beat up and you got, you're just battered everywhere and yet you keep on getting up no matter what. Somebody over in the corner saying, stay down, just forget about it, but you're not staying down. You're not down for the count. You don't know when to quit because you keep on and you got people that are encouraging you that come along outside you and say, you can do this. And more importantly, Jesus Christ. The one who knows what it's like to endure all things. And he's saying, you can do this in my power. You can do this in my strength, in my might. And we trust in him to accomplish what he's doing. And so these people did that. Surely in themselves, in the circumstances they were facing, they weren't gifted enough. They weren't better than everybody else in some way or another. That they were just supernaturally, I mean, they were naturally better. They may have been supernaturally gifted, though, through Christ. And because of that... They did these things. That may scare you. Let me qualify that for you to think I'm stepping out of bounds in the name of Christian faith. All I'm saying is when you have Jesus Christ, aren't you enabled? Doesn't Philippians remind us what we can do in Christ? Can anybody remind me what Philippians 4.13 says? Doesn't it say I can do some things? A little bit of things? No, we know it's more than that. It's all things. And that's who enables us to navigate whatever obstacles come into our life. And that we can still remain faithful. We can still do the things that God has put before us. Here's what I'm finding. Can I just do real talk with y'all for a moment? Straight up, honest preacher to congregation, under shepherd to flock. Here's what I hear. Pastor, I know God is faithful, but I just can't do this anymore. And you're not wrong. But that's what you said when you first started the journey, remember? God is faithful. I'm not good enough. How do I do this? But somewhere in life, our faithfulness was put to the test, and we started to stumble and fall. What happened? Well, we started relying on ourselves. And this church is not relying on themselves. Paul says, I'm going to go check Timothy because I haven't heard back from them. Again, no internet, no text messaging, no live streams, okay? So there's, there's gaps of correspondence. And I'm really concerned because I know when I talked to them last, there were some issues going on, and I hope they're healthy. I hope they're staying in the fight. It's not easy over there in Thessalonica, but let's be honest, it's not easy anywhere in this world, right? Things are literally tough all over. So God, so God brings along people to prop us and encourage us and help us, like Paul, like Timothy. And I want to remind you that God still loves the struggling. As he did then, he still loves the struggling today. He loves those that are faithful to him. In spite of the things, you know, the old saying is true, iron does sharpen iron, and every one of us needs to find that iron circle of people that will, will, will be there thick and thin. And we as, as churches lean on each other and continue to encourage each other. He reminds us here, I know that tempter's there. Well, what would he be tempting us to do? To quit, <laughs> to bail, let somebody else do it. You, you go do you, you just check out, it'll be okay. By the way, I should have started this conversation in the beginning. This would be a great time, if you haven't already, to put the seatbelt sign on. I thought of y'all two weeks back when I was flying, and nonstop turbulence was my flight from DFW down to Orlando. And I just preached on this, and I'm like, God, I know you got a sense of humor, but come on. And, you know, everything's here. And we're going to try to find the right altitude because everything's bumpy where we're going. That's always going to make your flight feel better, right? And so we're, we're doing this, and we're doing this. And, of course, the seatbelt sign's on nonstop. And I'm like, yeah, I know, that. I know that code. I know what we do in church. But this is not for the faint of heart because the tempter is after you. He knows your role. He knows who you can influence. Do you, I'm going to say some things that may not, you may never heard before. I hope it doesn't bother you. But I'm going to tell you, you know, you might be able to influence people that even me as a pastor, other people in, in spirit leadership in this church, servant leadership could never get to, but you specifically have been raised up in that moment to be able to do what only you can and God has built you for this moment and you're going to go, well, Pete will do it or uh, Brother David will do it or one of the deacons will get to it or Brother Austin will get and you're going to dismiss the opportunity but more importantly, you're going to dismiss the fact of what God's leading you to do. You know the old saying, you had one job? <laughs> what happened? Where are we at? 
in the things of God? Have we let the tempter win? Have we let the tempter win in our life? Because he would cause us to dismiss the opportunities. Deuteronomy was a great opportunity. Deuteronomy 31, Moses is passing the baton to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31 and 6. And he reminds him about how important it is in this moment to rise up and to do what only you can do. Not, not, not any other people group. And Joshua is called out, actually, if you look at the text specifically. But in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Scripture records in verse 6. It says there, be strong and of good courage. Fear not. Doesn't sound like anybody quitting there. Nor be afraid of them. Talking about the people you're going to come into with the land. Why? why? Why wouldn't we be afraid? Well, yeah, it's natural, but here's why. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, for he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. It's a good reminder to us all that we have the Lord Jesus Christ to help us in the obstacles as they face the promised land, as we stay strong in the faith to be remain faithful because God designed us to go the distance. Secondly, I want you to see the faithful also carry a testimony. Verses 6, 7, and 8 really preach. And so let me just remind you of what this says again in, 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 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. But now when Timotheus came unto you, or came from you unto us and brought us good tidings, that's a powerful statement I'm going to get to in a moment, of your faith and charity or love, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to you. So yeah, they, they, share, they exchange pleasantries there. But watch verse 7. Therefore, brethren, or as a result, brethren, brothers, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. And it's something that Paul sent Timothy to go do something because he was concerned about them. But by the time Timothy came back, Paul was the one in need of an injection of encouragement and the people with him, and that report was such a blessing. See, your faithfulness, you don't know what your faithfulness is doing. Your faithfulness is preaching to others a message that I may not even be able to preach. That, may, you, that you may get more encouragement to somebody than a message from Sunday morning, and I'm not dismissing what we do, but I'm not going to dismiss the power of the testimony of the faithful either and what we can do for God. Thick and thin, no matter what may come our way, we're not going to be moved. We're not going backwards. We're going forward. I don't care what the wall says. We'll find a way around it. We'll deal with it because we're going to go forward. Paul was so encouraged by their testimony. And then we see verse 8. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. That's a statement of their testimony and what it did for them, how it moved them, how it encouraged them. Well, the Bible speaks to this. Hebrews I hate to continue to find this passage because I continue to use it a lot in pastoral ministry, but it speaks and it's the word, so I don't know what else to do. Hebrews chapter 10 speaks to this very comment here, speaks to what we're at today. In verse 23, he tells us to do something. He's, the, the writer, which I believe is Paul, is encouraging the, the Hebrews, hold fast. That's the idea of don't quit, endure, stay strong. What? The profession of our faith Without wavering, you can't be moved. So circumstances come. Why? Because he's faithful that promised. It just reiterates what we've already said. And then verse 24, let us consider one another. See, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about God. But we, we have to think about others, not just ourselves. Let us consider one another to provoke. The idea of provoke means to stir up, okay? You're, you're, you're doing something more. And you're provoking unto love. So usually we think of it negatively, but it's positive. Love and good works. Okay? Now watch. This requires some commitment. And this is why faithfulness is a struggle for a lot of people, just like maritally. It's a commitment. Okay? Not forsaking the commitment, the assembling of ourselves together. We need it, but others need it. Watch. As the manner of some is, so what Paul was experiencing in those days, we see still today where people check in and check out, and it's unfortunately part of the norm now in church life. But he says, but exhorting, exhorting has the idea of giving that encouragement, Timothy, Paul, Thessalonia, but exhorting one another for so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, when we come together and we remain faithful in our, in our, in our coming together, and, and, and our attendance in church is only a part of this. 
but it's a demonstration outwardly of what God's doing internally. And when we are faithful to the things of God, prayer, Bible study, sharing our faith, being involved in the things that matter, that set a high level premium, when we put our, put our lock, stock, and barrel in those things, not only does it do us good, but it does others good. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Uh, imagine, if you would, there was five of us in here instead of however many we have today. I check in with the guys in the media booth. They said, yeah, nobody even checked in online. They don't care. I'd give it a pass. Mr. Payton's with us today. I know him and Miss Pam. They always check in with us, you know, and I'm glad to have them here today with us visiting. But, but, but I, I know that many depend on that. But the, the disadvantage, boy, I tell you what, I love when people tell me, Pastor, I don't, get, I don't worry about church. I don't live, you know, I don't live far off. You know, I'm around the corner, but I just watch at home. Why? Why would you not want to do this? This is life right here. This is, you know, we get to get together and talk and enjoy fellowship in Christ and encourage each other and show our faithful pledges to Christ because not only is it encouraging to us, but because I'm here, maybe I can encourage you, and you're here, you can encourage me. That's life in Christ, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And they had a testimony of this. The faithful are examples. It's interesting they use the term good tidings. It's when we think about sometimes with Christmas, but it's where we get the word evangelism. It's the gospel. It's the same idea of the word, the gospel. What does the gospel do? It changes our life forever. It, it points to Christ well, you and I are living testimonies of the gospel and how we conduct ourselves. So am I a walking billboard of the living Savior, the risen Savior, the one that's not just in a stable somewhere, gag gag goo goo and you know, that's not Jesus anymore, y'all. I'm, I'm bursting some bubbles already in advance. I'm glad he came by way of the manger, but I'm glad he's still not there. I'm glad he passed through the cross at Calvary and he rose victoriously three days later. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. They had that kind of testimony. That's what they're saying here. As he wrote this, the testimony revealed their strong faith and their love. I think it's important you see the word faith and charity together or love because they work simultaneously. Matter of fact, I think there was three gifts that Paul wrote about when he wrote the church at Corinth. He talked about expectation as well. And that could have easily been a part of this conversation because when we expect Christ to come, it's not the result, of, I mean, that's a, that's a byproduct of our faith in him because we're motivated by love for him. And as a result, we look for him. We long to see him again. This is the picture of what it should be in the life of the faithful. And our minds are on the things of Christ. It takes willful determination, though. Don't we live in a very, I don't know the word, distracting? It seems like one minute, and, and when you struggle with focus like I do. It's very challenging. Um, I, I, I have to literally write things down and try to cross them off each day. And it's not because I forget. It's because I get started on one thing and next thing I want to jump into something else before I'm done with this. And maybe none of you else have that problem. I'm taking my meds, Tad. I'm trying my best, okay? So anyway, the focus thing, you know? And, it, and it's, it's, it's real. It's real. And, and I get distracted easily. Squirrel, squirrel, you know, it's just what happens. And, and so, yeah, I'm like those guys on the movie Up, okay? I get it. You are too. You, you, don't, you ain't standing here right now. So anyway, here's what I'm getting at. In a world full of distraction, in a world full of circumstances, are you going to be faithful? Man, we need people with a powerful testimony and say, I don't care what comes my way. I'm not going to be moved. I'm not backing down a lick. I'm not going anywhere, man. I'm here. I'm, this is where it's at. This is what it's about. Life in Christ. Too many people today are separating from the premises. And we've forgotten that our job is to be standing in his promises. We're separating. We're dividing. And you know that, that hurts not only you, but it hurts us. It hurts the name of Christ because of the gaps now that are created that God designed each of us to fulfill. I think about deep people that I've been in church with, that I've known in the faith, that are no longer walking in the faith. Literally, somebody I wished a happy birthday to recently, strong advocate of Christ, and I talked about this a couple months back, but now I've walked away from God entirely. I don't know how they do that. I'm not going to hate them. I still wish them happy birthday, and I pray for them good person on the outside. I mean, probably would do anything just like most of us, but 
There's a disconnect somewhere. Something happened. And being faithful and let alone anything to do with God now is no longer on the radar. And this is reality as people continue to deconstruct their faith more and more and more. That's why, as I think about these things in verse 9, I come to this understanding. I thank God for the faithful. Man, more than ever before. There were people that we used to sing that old soul hymn in church, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, I shall not be. That goes both ways I'm learning in Christian faith now. <laughs> there's, there's some that literally take the song and its word, and there's others that are like, I ain't moving nowhere, preacher. You ain't going to get me to budge. I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do, and that's it. And what a sad commentary. Shouldn't our life in Christ be evident by the fruit that we do? And if fruit means growing, that means health. But there's, there can't be growth if we're stoved up hardened and i'm so thankful for people who want to live by faith and walk by faith and i and i'm gonna be honest with you i had reluctance to preaching this message just from a personal perspective because i know what it invites you said preacher you want to preach on this stuff and the devil's like i heard you buddy i'm gonna pour it on now and i know what job was job was a man of faith wasn't he and i saw what that man went through i read all about his story and i and i know that by preaching outwardly these things and encouraging you to do, I means I've got to be an example of this too, no matter what circumstances I face. Easier said than done, I get it. But so that way, I'm, I'm going to call you up this week and say, remember that Paul Timothy thing? I need some encouragement. And it's okay, by the way, if you call me up and say, Pastor, I need some encouragement. I'm going through some things. Man, that's what we're here for. And we can do this together. There was such a great joy in this letter and I want to remind you, and we don't know all the details, and I can give you some of the speculation, but it's really not pointed to the message because we're not Thessalonians and we're not there. We're here. And I don't have to give you illustrations about what life was like for it to be hard because you know what life is like hard. You're walking in some of this right now. You understand the adversity and the challenges of raising a family in 2023, of trying to navigate school or a career, or, or, or trying to be a, a godly man or woman towards your spouse or parents to your kids or members to a church. You understand the challenges that come. I'm not going to have to preach all that to you because you live it. You know what health adversities can bring and you understand that and yet you're still here. <laughs> the world says why but the faithful one says why I'm not. Where else would I go but to the Lord and that's the power of the gospel in our lives. It reminds me and I wish we had time to do a deep dive in Nehemiah 11 and 12 so there's your homework. Nehemiah is one of my favorite books. I've preached it. I love preaching it, and I'll probably preach it again here sometime in the near future. But I want you to look at two verses specifically in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. So backstory in a nutshell, they've had a, they got removed because of um, captivity, and Nehemiah petitions the king as the cupbearer, and he gets to go down, and and he gets to rebuild the wall, okay? Good story, great message, but what about afterward? Everything lived happily ever after? No, there were still things to be done. The land had to be repopulated again, and the king was gracious. But what I love about this shows something about a heart of people that are faithful. I'm gonna give you, king, I'm gonna give you the King James, but I'm gonna give you a 2023 version here because you might not catch this, ready? And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. Well, that's where they're supposed to be because that's the capital. You're there, good deal. The rest of the people also cast lots. In other words, they did a little vote to bring one of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. Don't go to verse two yet. Do y'all see what that means? That means um, some of y'all really did not want to move out of Mount or Cushing or Timpson or Central Heights. Nobody wanted to live in that. Sorry for y'all that live directly in that. Jody, um, sorry guys, um, no shade, okay? But the ones that live in Knack, no offense, or, or Henderson, nobody wanted to live in a big city. You had to pull teeth. These are country folk. They like living in the suburbs, in the outskirts, okay? But they also knew living in Jerusalem could be dangerous. It invited a lot of attention from the people. They already saw what happened before. Is somebody going to come back in and tear down the walls? Maybe we're safer out here. There's a lot of speculation, and the message is not based on speculation, so who cares what I think? More importantly, what God says, verse 2. Watch this. And the people blessed all the men, look, that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. 
Some of y'all didn't care. You, you said, oh, look, if I got to get rid of my spread out here in, in, in Mount or in Cushing or wherever I'm at so that I can live over here for the glory of God, that's where I'm at. Count me in. Faithful. Faithful. And you know, if you'll read down through chapter 11 and chapter 12, you're going to find some people there and you're going to go, hey, what are you doing? And they weren't just sitting around going, well, we just decided to move back and, and drink lemonade and watch everybody do the work. You read through that, and you're going to find people doing amazing things. Well, eventually Ezra comes along because he reestablishes worship. By the way, worship was a good thing in the Old Testament, as it still should be a prominent thing today. And so they had gotten away from that, so they needed to reestablish worship. And Zerubbabel, of course, would come back and rebuild and do it a little bit differently than Solomon's temple because Solomon's was destroyed in the takeover. But in chapters 11 and 12, we see faithful leaders and faithful workers. People who are serving, the Bible says, people who are working, people who are praying. We need prayer warriors, faithful prayer warriors, people who are watching, people who are singing, love to sing. They had the gift and they were faithful in using it for the glory of God and so on and so on. What would compel a people, by the way, I, I, I mean, I've referenced Sam Ballot, uh, Tobiah, uh, Geshem, the, 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 these people that would come along and, and stir the pot okay, and, and, and try to make fun of them and, and try to bring them down. But they were, they, while they got a little rattled, they weren't moved. You know what the Bible says in one of the key verses in all of Nehemiah is Nehemiah 4 and 6. The Bible says, the people had a mind to work. They saw what was going on around them, but they saw God, and that's what mattered more. They had a mind to work. Where would Jerusalem have been Without them, where would Thessalonica and the church there be without them? And bringing it closer home, where would we be at Landmark Missionary Baptist without them? The faithful, the ones you could put your de depend on, bank on, know you're going to be there thick and thin. You're going to come through in the clutch. You're, you're faithful to study. You don't have time, but you're going to study because your class matters because those people need to hear the word. You're not going to skim it and give whatever jargon you want to say. You're gonna, the word matters. Look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm just going to be real with y'all. If you get me up here and I start rambling about how good I am and how much I can tell you about my life, look, I can do that over a cup of coffee one day. That's fine. But this is word <laughs> because this is God's word. It's not Pete's. Boy, I don't know what a mess that becomes when it becomes about me and it's less about God. So, yeah. You say, well, how do you know they were faithful? Well, we could see it, but we don't have their names, do we? It's interesting we don't get their names. I know Hebrews 11 gives us a little cheat sheet of some names of some people that were really faithful, and thank God for Hebrews 11 and those testimonies. But it's interesting that Paul doesn't mention any of the names. It's not that he didn't know them. Sometimes what matters more than the faces is the faith. And being faithful is what it's all about. Do you know the name of Jesus as Savior? You know what draws us to Christ? Love. Do you know what brings us to Christ? Faith. We weren't there. We didn't see Calvary's cross. We didn't see Golgotha, but we believe by faith that God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. But see, what's beautiful about that faith is not just what it's saving faith, but when we walk with Christ, Walking with Christ produces living faith. Where would I go? Why would I leave? This is everything. This is the life and more abundant in that. Would you be counted today amongst godly to be counted as one of his faithful? Thick and thin, no matter what comes. I know life gets hard and troubles. We see him in the church there. We see him in our lives today. But we know, as we read earlier, it's not about experiencing. We all go through them. It's enduring and will we do that? And will we come alongside and stick with Christ as he sticks with us and told us he would guide us through the land of giants and the promised land and so on? The world and landmark desperately, desperately need more faithful. That bench is getting shallower and emptier every week. The recruits are not lining up like they used to. God has issued a call today in this moment. In our spirit of thanks, he's issued a call for the faithful to rise.
to come back to faithfulness in Christ, to living the life. And yes, I know what you're thinking because I've sat and I have sat that this week as I've studied this more and more. But God, it's so daggum hard. And you're not wrong. The world just wants to continue to tell us to quit. So I want to challenge you. You're going to hear something you never hear. Go ahead and quit. Quit. But no, with quitting comes a lot of things you're not going to enjoy. If you're a child of God, he's going to make you miserable. He's going to make you, he's going to, you're going to feel loss. You're going to feel pain. You think you feel pain now? It's going to get worse. What's the Bible say? To whom the Lord loves, what's he do? I didn't write it. I'm just telling you. You say, but that's, that's hard, Pastor. Jesus told us when he prayed for us in the garden, this wasn't going to be easy. But remember, he said, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. I just want you to know that, I just want them to know you're in it with them. And that's what he's reminded us today. You can be faithful. You can do this because God did this, and God through you can do this if you let him. But I'm more concerned even today, more than just a faithful church, faithful group of believers, is somebody knowing faith. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, let me encourage you, you can. You can begin this journey, and you're going, but I don't know if I want to sign up for what you described. Can I give you the, I know people don't like to get the spoiler alert, but here's your spoiler alert. You think life is bad now? Eternity in hell is a lot worse. You don't want to go there. Jesus Christ loves you, friend. In spite of ourselves, in spite of all our wickedness and sin, and that's why he gave his son on the cross for you and me. All you've got to do is accept him and believe. Faith. <laughs> but you do faith every day, don't you? I passed a lot of cars the last couple of days that were traveling busy highways. Faith. You get out and mount on 259. <laughs> Or worse, 315, faith. You put your kid in a public school today, faith. You go out to a church. Have you watched the news? Faith. We exercise faith all the time, and this is one of the best results you'll ever get from faith. Eternal life in Christ if you'll believe and accept him, and you can do that today. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. This is a time of decision between you and the Lord. And you're not doing this for me. Man, don't do it for me. What a mistake. I can't give you any of these things. I can give you a pat of back, uh, out of boy, but that's only going to last you five seconds. Jesus lasts for eternity. Do you know him as Savior? Are you walking with him today? If you don't know him, friend, you can pray right now. Right now, right where you sit and say, God, I don't think I know you. I've done the religion, but I don't have the relationship, and I, I want Christ. I want to know what faith really is. You've done so much for me, and you can call upon him as Savior in your own words. Father, forgive me. Father, I want you to save me. It can be a simple prayer like that. I, you know what to say. I don't want to put your words in your mouth. Maybe today you're one of those that have prayed and said, I trust Christ. I want to encourage you to come when we have our we open our eyes momentarily, and you can come and testify, because there's a lot of people that will be here to encourage you in your steps of faith with him. But maybe you're struggling today. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe the things of God that once were are not anymore. Friend, I know the world's hard. God's greater. Put your faith in him. Don't put it in other things. Keep your faith in God. Don't let stress, don't let anger don't let bitterness get in the way. Where is God in all this? I pray you're reaching out to him, calling upon him, looking to him. He is so faithful. Father God, we thank you for what you are doing. And even in this time of decision, may you continue to do. Stir our hearts, convict us to come to you, to come to the cross, come to Christ. Father, and if we are children of God, may the redeemed of the Lord say so. May we speak faith. May we walk in faith. May we invoke Christian love and may we show hope, a life of expectation in Christ as we look for your second coming, Father. And I do pray for those that are struggling right now, toe in the line. I pray they'll come home. 
There's no shame in walking the aisle and saying, I want to get right. I want to get back. I want to get closer. I've got a burden I want to share. The shame would be to go away in the same condition we came in and do nothing about it. Hell is eternity. I pray we realize the glories of heaven in Christ today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you?